The Holocaust was the systematic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately 6 million Jews and 5 million other people. Roma and Sinti, political dissidents, people with disabilities, Jehovah Witnesses, gay men, and people labeled as asocial, and others who were considered undesirable or inferior, were systematically segregated and murdered by the Nazi regimen. It is the most well-documented crime in history, yet, as with all genocides, there is a dangerous agenda of denial that has run through the beginning, middle, and end that we must continue to overcome through education. On this Holocaust Remembrance Day, we are proud to invite Nir Arad, parent of a Mount Sai High School student, to share his personal family story of survival. My grandmother was a very uh, industrious woman, I'd say. She was hardworking, was a person of her word. One, one story that can maybe tell a little bit about her character is that uh, when my uh, grandfather passed away, that was before I was born, he owned a factory uh, back in Israel where they lived. And uh, that was before the days of computers and internet. Everything was written in, in like notebooks and notes. And so uh, people that, uh, he, that owed him money kind of tried to walk away. People that uh, he owed to uh, would come to my grandmother and try to inflate the amounts of uh, how much he owed. Luckily, she found a notebook with all those numbers written down and she promised every single one of them that they will get their money back. And she basically took over that business and worked uh, day and night to make sure that everybody's paid off and, and the family name and, and his legacy um, are not stained in any way. So that, that, that's my parental grandmother. My uh, maternal side also went through the Holocaust and I was the first grandchild of two branches of families that went through the Holocaust, uh, obviously I was spoiled. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I can say that the topic of Holocaust, we were, I was pretty shielded from that. They did not like to talk about that. They did not tell stories. They, uh, it was pretty rare. When I tried to talk to my grandmother about that once, she pretty quickly went into tears. She couldn't talk much about that. Uh, and she was a very talkative woman otherwise. She would be playful and talkative and could have, we could have any discussion about any, any, any topic, but uh, this was something that was really hard for her. So I'm, I'm very happy that my family was able to, at, at some point, to interview my grandmother and her sisters uh, and compile their memories into a book which helps us, the uh, next generations, to learn about what happened to them. Um, how, like what, tell us what happened to your grandmother. Like we want to know kind of what, how she changed and how those values strive through what happened to her. My grandmother's family lived in, the, in, in an area called uh, Transylvania. Yeah, that's where the vampires come from. That's the same place. I'm a vampire. They lived there, and that, that, that uh, stretch of land uh, was switching hands between Romania and Hungary. Uh, back in 1940, uh, Germany, Nazi Germany and Italy forced uh, the annexation of that part of Transylvania to Hungary, which was supportive of Germany. And uh, at that time, they felt the change coming. Uh, shortly after that annexation, they were made to wear a yellow patch, saying that they are Jewish. Every, all the Jewish people were, were forced to wear that. Uh, in fact, my um, grandmother's best friend, she had a, a very good friend who was not Jewish, and that friend insisted, insisted on wearing one, although she was not Jewish, just as a sign of uh, you know, solidarity. Uh, but those were few. Most people were keeping the distance, and, um, and, and gradually there were more and more limitations. Like at some point, they were told they can only go shopping in the market after 10 a.m. So other people can get the best stuff first before they get there. They, they only get the leftovers. 
later on they were confined to their homes and at that point they told that they were told that soon they will be moved to uh, some other place where only uh, uh, Jewish people live and shortly after that they were made to walk to a train transport and were taken to uh, taken to Auschwitz uh, to the uh, concentration camp so that was a pretty horrible trip on itself. They were put in like cattle uh, uh, trains and uh, there were like tens, if, many tens of people in each, in each cart and there was just like a barrel on the corner which served as a toilet for everyone. They were given some water in the stops but uh, no food for four days. Sometimes they would hear airplanes flying over and, and bombs falling around and they hoped that one of the bombs will just kill them because it was better than, than living like that. They, they, uh, they were that desperate. And after days and days of travel, they reached Auschwitz. My grandmother was there with uh, two of her sisters. Uh, a fourth sister uh, lived in another town and worked in another town, so she was separate from them. Uh, and my grandmother was also holding on to her uh, younger brother, uh, who was really, uh, uh, I think, under 10, maybe 9, maybe 8. Um, and uh, she walked out of that train, and uh, there stood uh, Josef Mengele. I don't know if uh, anyone here heard the name, but... Uh, he, he, he was known as the Angel of Death. He was a medical doctor who was uh, experimenting on uh, um, prisoners, on, on, on Jewish people or other people. He was especially known for taking twins and conducting various medical uh, uh, experiments to see how uh, uh, their genetics uh, uh, is affecting or affected by, by those experiments. And, and she saw him. And he told her, hand your younger brother to your parents because you are going right and they are going left. And right meant live, left means die. And she had to hand her brother over. He didn't say, say that, he just said, hand him over because you're going, you're going this way. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, and she never saw her uh, parents and, and brother again. Um, so she went with her two sisters. Uh, they were in Auschwitz for a while. It was the, the, the uh, conditions obviously were horrible. Uh, the, the food was like the, there, there was a story about this like coal soup that they had to eat because there was nothing else. That was the only thing that could provide some nourishment and, uh, and, and, and it was really hard to uh, digest that thing, but they had to because they had no choice. And a couple of days after they arrived there, uh, they, were, they were forced you know, to stand outside on the, on the field and, and, and uh, uh, go to uh, uh, do some work. Um, but uh, they were able to find uh, the fourth sister standing in one of the other groups. And they managed to do a swap because the sister was with a, uh, 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 another friend of hers and they were with a cousin of that friend. So they swapped the sister with the cousin so all four sisters are together. And from that point they did not let anyone uh, 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 get separate. Uh, and that's basically what kept them through Auschwitz, because when one was sick, the others covered for her. They would get her food, they would do her work, they would do anything to keep all of them together and alive. And they all, all four of them survived Auschwitz. And, and, and that, that's the only known story of four sisters making it alive out of Um, and after that, uh, at some point when it was clear that the Germans are losing the war, they made them march for days and days, uh, 
they didn't just leave them at Auschwitz. They, they uh, took them, I think, into Germany, um, or towards Germany. I'm not, I'm not sure about the exact path, but they had to march for many days. Uh, many died in the process, but still, since they stuck together, they were able to, to make it until the point that uh, American soldiers actually uh, um, freed them. Uh, and after that, they made their way back home to see if anyone else is alive. Uh, and that, that was pretty much the duration of the war. And, and, and that, that's the story I, I wanted to tell. Like growing up in this family and having this background, how, how has that influenced you as a person? I think later on when I, when I grew up and I was, well, was mature enough to understand what they went through and how holding to who they were and to the values that they cherished helped them get through that and uh, uh, basically saved them. I, 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 I grew up to admire that. How, what do you want people to know about the Holocaust? So growing up in Israel, there is a certain number that is uh, strongly associated with the Holocaust, and that number is six million. And that's the number of uh, Jewish people who were killed during the, the Holocaust by, by, by the Nazis. Obviously, the total number is much higher, but whenever somebody in Israel says six million, that would be the first association. Now, this number is, is, is not a number we can easily comprehend. It is very big, especially when we're talking about people. So trying to visualize that, and you know, I'm trying to do that uh, uh, only for the, the purpose of this visualization, so uh, I hope nothing I say will be taken out of context. But think about, you know, you come to uh, Mount Sai High School and there's like a game maybe, and everybody's there. All, all the students are there. And there are about like 2,000 students, I think, in Mount Sai, so maybe a little bit more. So you know what 2,000 people look like, OK? Now imagine the next day you come to school, and you're told that they're all gone. They are not here anymore. There are new 2,000 people with hopes, dreams, families, desires, friends, people they don't like, hobbies, wherever. 2,000 other people. None of them were, was here yesterday, they're all new. And then, next day again, and again. After five days of a uh, uh, learning week, that, that, that's 10,000 people. To see six million people, you'll have to go through those 2,000 people every day from first grade to 12th grade throughout your school years. That's that, that's when it will get to six million people. Okay, 2,000 people every day for 12 years. So that's what I want people to remember. Um, and now we're gonna kind of close it off and uh, with the question of, do you think your family has had closure with what's happened and why or why not? So yeah, that, <laughs> you're asking me some tough questions here. <laughs> And I must say, I, I don't think there can be a personal or family or a closure at a personal or a family level. The, the, the skulls are there forever and only, you know, uh, uh, some are taken away when people pass away. Obviously, I don't feel it to the same degree that my grandmother mother felt it, uh, but it's not gone. Uh, surprisingly, there is some closure at the national level. At least that's the way I feel about uh, uh, the fact that last year, for the first time, uh, an Israeli Air Force squadron of fighter jets landed in Germany for a joint exercise with the German army. And uh, you can only imagine the excitement of the uh, uh, team that was doing that. And uh, they quoted the commander of, of that uh, squadron talking about his feelings. Uh, yeah, being in a place where we are not afraid for our lives, so that we can 
uh, uh, fight for our life and, 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 and maybe today even make amends uh, with the uh, uh, country and the people who did that to us, I definitely see that as, as a kind of approach.